we knew that if we were going to call a meeting, it would be basically to provide information. So where would that come from? We were really fortunate. It was a remarkable cohort of doctors at that time. I was also interested to pursue further a connection with some of the American physicians that I knew vaguely um, and decided to go to a, a meeting of this group in Hawaii in early 1983 and set the timing to be such that I would come back from this meeting with information about kind of what's going It made sense to me if I could learn what's going on there, these will be our issues in six months to a year. Also had an opportunity maybe to bring in someone from out of town, we thought, and the first choice was, for me anyway, Paul Popham, who was one of the founders of the Gay Men's Health Crisis. I remember calling him up. It was really easy to get a hold of, and asked if there was anyone who might be able to come out, and immediately, I'll be there, on their dime. He knew how important this was. I remember him so fondly because of this uh, magnanimous gesture of just, you know, on your own dime coming out here and being so critical because he gave it legitimacy in a sense. I was in charge of printing up assembling the information that we knew and printing it up in a brochure and um, having it printed up to and distributed. I'm pretty sure that almost no copies of that exist because we kept, they just vanished. You know, I'd print 500 and they'd be gone the next day and I'd print 500 more and they'd be gone again. We wondered whether we'd get a lot of people out. Ha! Huh. Didn't have to worry about that. Place was jammed. The room was full, absolutely full. It was full to bursting, and it was a bunch of worried guys who weren't saying much. What brings me here is our concern over an epidemic that is killing gay men all over the world. Most of you know now how devastating this outbreak of AIDS has been, and nowhere more so than in New York, where, absolute, where roughly half of all cases have been reported. Most of my friends in New York have been touched in some way by this tragedy. Friends have died. The deaths have almost always been long, painful, and unbelievably heartbreaking. I have been through this twice myself. And I think it's fair to say that it has changed my life. Just as it's changed the lives of so many of us in New York City. But I'm here with the good news, not more of the bad. Rough as it is, this epidemic has challenged us like we've never been challenged before. And we've met the challenge. It's hard, it's real hard. But I think we're finding out just what we're made of, just how strong we are. And probably most important, we're showing how gay men came through in a crisis. That's what we've got, a crisis. When five other men and I founded our volunteer non-for-profit corporation more than a year ago in New York, we named it Gay Men's Health Crisis. Not because we wanted to spread panic, but because we knew by then that this was it, the ultimate test of our strength. He was really, uh, really well informed and put everybody in Vancouver in touch with a lot of other people in places like San Francisco and New York. They presented a lot of information which seemed to be very significant. Something very big is happening here. It's happening to the gay community. It's happening potentially to me. And I remember that there was definitely a lot of questions being asked. It was very interactive. It wasn't just we're giving you this information. There was a lot of back and forth uh, questions. I believe there's some kind of uh, tests being done on AIDS in Vancouver. I was sort of wondering, do you know who's responsible for this and what's the nature of these tests? There are no specific tests being done. I think what you may be making reference to is a study that's, that is being conducted. And lots of questions. And surprisingly sophisticated. So uh, the thought that people weren't informed or didn't know about this, no, that wasn't the case. They were desperate for information. 
See, last year, Congress gave us AIDS. This year, screwing around gives us AIDS. What's going to give us AIDS next year? This is my question. And I say it influenced me enough, it introduced the concept of safe sex, and that's maybe why I'm here today, because after that uh, forum, I started to practice safe sex. At the meeting in Hawaii, I had encountered Dr. Harold Jaffe of the CDC, who advised me that in fact they had identified patient zero as a flight attendant from Montreal. Uh, I advised him that in fact the man had moved to Vancouver. We had at AIDS Vancouver discussed the fact that there was a man in town who was perhaps patient zero. And when a French Canadian man got up and began asking very pushy questions, and by pushy I mean he asked questions about all the things for which there were no answers, and asked them in a way that kind of felt like pushing buttons. It, it really didn't occur to me that at the time that, that this was the Gaetan that I'd met once or twice in Manhattan. He was the first person to be diagnosed with AIDS, to the best of my knowledge, the first white person in North America. Gaetan was regarded by the Center for Disease Control as patient zero. So you shouldn't tell someone that AIDS or a symptom of AIDS because there is no specific reason why you should get in contact with AIDS with infectious agent like you mentioned. Like if you have a lover who has AIDS and you don't have AIDS, what is the warning you give to people? It seems like there's a kind of a fear towards those people here that who could have the same thumb or if have the same thumb or if have the disease, you should fear those people, but you should, you know, not necessarily fear those people. My personal feeling about it is, and again, it can't be proved, is that some contagious agent is probably involved in the transmission of AIDS. And if I were an AIDS patient and we're going to continue to have sex with people, I would tell that partner that I was having sex with that I am an AIDS patient so that they can make that decision. If they want to go ahead and have sex with me, fine. But at least I've warned them and given them the decision and let them know. The hepatitis vaccine, the new vaccine that is now uh, offered to gay men has been um, developed with gay men hepatitis. So therefore, anyone who would receive such vaccine could be exposed to AIDS. Because gay men are high risk population for hepatitis B, they were the people originally studied for it and given the vaccine. On the other hand, there's no, not one shred of evidence that this vaccine actually causes any syndrome like you, like uh, AIDS. And I recall leaning over to Jeff Maines as moderator to say, please, if you don't get him off this microphone, he will undo any good we've done in the last hours. If you think you may have, or you could be a concerned person with AIDS, if you present yourself to your doctor, what can they test to you and ask him to be undertaken in manner to uh, confirm if you are possibly a carrier or not? If you are sick and you go to your doctor and you ask for tests, there are only certain limited ones he can do. He cannot check out whether or not you've been exposed to AIDS. That test simply does not exist. And the band played on. It was Randy Schultz's The First History of AIDS and, and HIV. And I must say that I never met Randy Schultz and I never spoke to him. And uh, he never contacted anybody that I knew to write his book. And I've never been able to finish it because I always get too angry. Everything that he wrote about that I had anything to do with directly, he got wrong. He had a number of things to say about Gaetan that I think were just wrong. I don't think he actually knew the man and, and had never sat down and spent any time with him.
One of the very first times that I talked with him, he was, he was not happy with the CDC. He was, he was very upset at how he had been treated by the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. He wanted to be an active participant in his own health care, and I don't think they were offering him that opportunity. People have told a lot of strange stories about Gaetan. All I can say is, I don't believe it. Gaetan was not a genius, but he was bright enough to know how to take care of his own health, and he was busy doing that as best he could. I spoke with Gaetan following the meeting, which was the first time we'd met, first time we talked. Several months later, I, he became a patient of mine, and I was his physician for about six months before he became ill and went back to Quebec and then, and then unfortunately died. I can't tell you how important it is that you have an organization who is going, is taking it upon themselves to help you through this epidemic, and it does take money, and anything you can do to help them finance their education of your community, it will save lives in your community. I guarantee you that.